to everybody. Um, oh great, the water doesn't have to sit All right. Um, so I, I wasn't supposed to be here giving this talk, um, so I wrote these slides on the plane on the way here, and uh, yesterday morning, so I missed some of the conference. Um, and that's actually somehow related to the talk, and I'll explain what this, but this is a picture of a dynamic non-event, which I will also explain a bit later, so you get what I'm talking about. So this talk was supposed to be given by Zahida Borat and about open source. That was in the schedule for a long time until a few days ago. Uh, unfortunately, she's uh, got, um, she's recovering from some bronchitis, pneumonia, related to the bad flu epidemic that went through a few months ago. Um, but she also, she works for me, and I was here anyway. So I said, well, since she can't come, I will, maybe I could do the keynote. So that's how this came about. And I look, thought about all the things I wanted to talk about, and I decided I needed to create something that felt more like a, a keynote. But also, because I was on a plane, I wanted to theme a few things here. So, um, just explain a little bit about my, my, what I currently do. I work for AWS. I've been there about a year and a half. I do three things for AWS. One is lots of talking at conferences, uh, both third-party conferences like this, but I also keynote some of the AWS summits around the world. I'll be in Tokyo, um, Taipei, Shenzhen, and um, Sao Paulo later this year doing AWS summits. I also run the open source team for AWS. So open source community, community evangelism, developer uh, engagement, that kind of thing. Um, we just announced yesterday uh, one of the AWS teams has contributed some security uh, enhancements to Redis. Yeah, so we do blogs about that. So that's kind of trying to communicate all the things that AWS is doing in open source. So if you want to talk about open source, I'll be here for the rest of the day, happy to have that discussion. And that's what Zahida was going to talk about. If you want to see her talk, she gave a similar talk at scale uh, a couple of months ago in Los Angeles, so you can go find that video. But what, let's get back to this then. So what is a dynamic non-event? Has anyone heard this phrase before? Uh, okay. Right. So, oh great, my screen just, oh no, there it is, all right. Um, it's really about safety. And this basically is a re rewrite of that phrase, most of you know, you can't be faster, cheaper, and safer all at the same time, right? So this is saying, work in a complex system, you have an economic constraint, so you can't be cheap. If you're trying to make it cheaper, then you know something else will happen. It, workload is talking about you know how many people it takes to do something, how long you give get, give those people to do the thing, and then safety. All right. So if you try to make it cheaper, you're probably going to make people work harder, or you're going to make it less safe. Right. And at some point, your system will sort of run out of one of these things, and you won't be time to complete the work, or it'll cost more than your budget, or the system will do something unsafe. So that's kind of the fundamental principle. Shouldn't be a big surprise, but um, it's, it's one of the core ideas underneath a whole lot of work on safety. Um, so here's the thing. How did we manage to non-eventfully get to this talk? You all turned up. Thank you. Uh, you survived the traffic in ch Chicago. You survived whatever plane flights were supposed to get you here. You survived last night's party and how much you had to drink and how long you stayed up late, some of you. But, you know, there's, what about all the people that aren't here today, right? So we actually have survivor bias. <laughs> you are all the survivors, and the survivor bias are the people in this room. And then there's a bunch of people that really wanted to be here but haven't quite got here yet, and they'll walk in later and wonder why you laugh at them. Um, Right, so there's, you have to think about all of the, um, you know, the people that didn't make it or the events that didn't happen and what happened and how biased your sample is by the things you're currently looking at. So that's one just little thing I wanted to talk about. But there's a fairly recent thing, and this, this talk, it may be a little bit uncomfortable. I'm gonna to touch on a few subjects that are a little bit, a little bit topical and uncomfortable for people. But um, some of you may know what this picture's about, all right? So um, a few weeks ago, um, there was a plane flying along, and all of a sudden, the engine decided to throw a fan blade. And, um, you know, so what's your reaction to this? A lot of people are very worried about maybe they don't want to take window seats on Southwest anymore, right? You get to choose your seat as you get on the plane. Everyone is now sitting in the aisle seats. I don't want to sit by the window because somebody got sucked out of the window. And then you're trying to figure out which window seat do you want. And if you look, you can see the, the where it is. 
sort of dot here? Anyway, the, the second one from the right, that's the one that got blown out. If you're sitting there looking at the engine, you go like, if that blind blade comes and hits me, which seat should I be in, right? So maybe you want to sit right forward so you're in front of the engine, but if, if you're sitting alongside the engine, that's only a problem if the fan blade blows up, blows when the, in, when the plane's not moving. When you're doing four or 500 miles an hour, all of this debris goes backwards, right? So some interesting, so how do you think about your safety on a plane nowadays, right? As opposed to a few weeks ago. And the, the interesting thing here is that this was the first airline casualty in nine years. The first US airline, US operated airline casualty in nine years. That is incredible, right? So think about that, like how many people died driving to work today in America or on in any other mode of transport? This is one of the safest possible ways to fly. You should be, by the time you get to the airport, you should be incredibly relieved you survived driving to the airport and now you're gonna sit in this metal tube uh, for the next few hours and be, oh, now I'm safe. Oh, yeah, this is the safest place you could possibly be. One of the safest places is to be sitting on that plane. And, and why is this safe? It's because it's such an inherently, crazily, scarily dangerous thing to be doing, to be sitting in a metal tube flying through, flying through the sky, that they, we have engineered it to the point where it is incredibly safe. And so just why is flying so safe? And, and what is it about this that, that, we, that we can extract? And I, and I want to just bring up a, um, something I did recently. I fly all over the world, and I did a flight I was in Dubai, and I needed to get back to San Francisco. I live near San Francisco, so I just took you know, Emirates flies from Dubai to San Francisco, and you look at the map, and you think, oh, they probably fly over New York or something, because it looks on the map like that. No, they fly over the North Pole. So how many people here have been to the North Pole? Cool, somebody. How many people have flown from Dubai to San Francisco? It turns out it's full of people from India because they're like, it's a couple of hours from India to get to Dubai, and then it was full of families going back and forth to India. And they've all been to the North Pole. Because this, this was like, we were flying, and I'm taking pictures of the, over the, of the little back of seat things, the picture I took. But the first thing you do when you leave Dubai is you fly over Iraq and various, and Iran, and all these places that you hear on the news that people are shooting at each other and shooting at planes and stuff. So it's like the first few hours, I'm terrified that we're gonna get shot out of the sky. The sky. I'm, I'm sure there's agreements not to do that, but still, it's a pretty, I'm flying over places that are scary places you hear about on the news, right? And then we're flying over a place where there aren't really any airports to land on, right? I get past Russia, and then there's like six, seven hours of North Pole, and then finally you get to Canada, and you come in and you get to San Francisco. So it's just a couple of hours at the beginning, and then if something bad happens, this is an A380. It's like an enormous double-decker bus thing. You know, it's got two, it's the one with the two, row, two rows of windows on it. It's an enormous plane. Um, they're pretty cool. So this is, this is actually at the North Pole. The nice thing about these planes, they have a camera pointing forwards and a camera pointing downwards. So I took a picture of what does it look like at the North Pole in late February, one of the coldest times of the year late winter, it should be frozen solid, right? There's cracks, <laughs> there's cracks in there. Why are there cracks in the ice in the middle of winter in the North Pole? I mean, you, even if you wanted to land, you'd be, you know, there's cracks in the ice, it's thin there. So this is supposed to be frozen, so that's a whole nother topic about climate change, but anyway. Um, outside temperature, minus 51 Celsius. That is why these planes, it's amazing you can build something that even survives flying around at minus 51 Celsius without going wrong. Um, the other really cool thing here is we stayed in the tame, same time zone till we got to the North Pole, right? So it went from, it was about 6 p.m. and then we crossed the North Pole and it went from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. instantly. <laughs> we did, because the time zones come together in, in a point and you're crossing this point and we went just like across those two segments and we landed up. So all of a sudden, it was, instead of being evening, it was morning. We had 12 hours of time zone just flipped, right, to your brain. And then the, the, uh, the, the, the compass that said what direction we were going was going round and around because if the plane tilted very slightly, north was sort of somewhere, right? So the, so the thing's going round and around. So lots of weird things happened at the North Pole. It was just, you know, I was just awake and watching the thing and just fascinated. Like, you know, everyone was watching movies of people shooting at things and all the stuff they watch on planes. And I'm, I'm staring at this, fascinated by it. 
And I took a picture out of the window, and this is my dynamic non-event, because this is one of the scarily dangerous things you could possibly do. Visit the North Pole in a, in a tube of metal at 500 miles an hour ridiculously. You know, it's just ridiculous that we can even do this. But the cool thing about this picture, this isn't sunrise or sunset, it's the sun is there all the time. You're on top of the North Pole and it's going around and the sun is permanently below the horizon, so it's just below the horizon. It's, a, it's just kind of a, just thought this was a cool picture, just poke, take out the window. All right, so while I was on this plane, I was reading a book. And the rest of this talk will be about a couple of books that are relevant to this. And this is the book, and it's not a terribly happy book to be reading. Um, why am I reading a book about workplace fatalities? Um, and the subtitle, Failure to Predict. This is because the kind of things that go wrong here are things like you, you, you don't have a, like on average at work, you don't say, I think, I think we're gonna kill three or four people today, right? That's not the goal of the company. Yeah, we'd like it to be two, but three or four is kind of our average daily people that die rate. No, it's zero is the goal. Unless, you're, unless your workplace is a battlefield, right? And then there's you know, some statistical probability that if you're a soldier in a war that you won't come back that day, right? But unless you're actually at a battlefield, you're not supposed to kill people at work. This is pretty universally accepted. I'm going to be controversial here. Um, so when somebody does get hurt uh, and somebody dies, it's a traumatic event, which is a statistical outlier, and it's incredibly hard to model. And this book is about, partly about that kind of problem, and it's partly about the trauma, the trauma and the behavior of companies when this happens, because no one's expecting it, no one's prepared for it. How do you deal with it? And if anyone, if anyone is ever in the unfortunate situation of having this happen to them, uh, Todd Conklin comes in and does sort of, um, not exactly counseling, but he's a, he comes in and helps companies get over it and figure out how to learn from it and how to do the right thing. Because quite often there's a knee-jerk reaction where people actually make it worse. And so that's the problem. Now, one interesting thing in this book is this statement. And you have to read this a few times to realize what it's saying. Airlines with the fewest incidents have the highest mortality risk. Right? If you have fewer incidents, you're more likely to kill people. If you have more incidents, you're less likely to kill people. This is intuitively backwards, all right? But this is a study, I, I've got the reference there if you wanna go Google it and read the study. What's going on here? This, this is a really, really deep thought because what actually is going on here is if you have a culture that says we want no accidents and we think that more incidents is like, if you have incidents, you're building up to an accident, we want fewer incidents. And what happens is it suppresses the reporting of incidents. And it makes people think that they shouldn't be reporting things, and they shouldn't be noticing that this thing's a bit broken, but it'll be okay, but if I report the incident, that's bad, right? That's zero tolerance. Like, no, if you go to a construction site, there's no accidents for some number of days. That's another example of this kind of thing. Those are the places where somebody dies tomorrow because there's no warning, there's no buildup in the system. You're not systematically removing um, removing risk from the environment by learning about all the things, by reporting all the small things. And by reporting on the small things, people are conditioned to be looking for things and they're conditioned to be learning and reporting on it. So this is something, and, and I'm reading this book because at AWS now, we are getting into environments where we are building safety critical systems in the cloud. And I'm trying to get my head around what that looks like. And we're getting into people shutting down whole data centers and the machines in those data centers um, transact the US economy, right? Just the best way of putting it. Or they, so if they go down, the US economy stops. Like if, if ever, you know, if you ever see like, sorry, there's something AWS is having an incident and tomorrow nobody gets paid, that's because the US banking system would be right running on these systems. So we want to avoid that <laughs> happening. Um, and there's safety critical systems that operate machinery and airlines and traffic systems and all these things. So there's a lot of things now where it used to run a data center and those things are now being put on AWS. And we think about what are the patterns and I'm sort of the architectural bleeding edge person. That's one of the things I do for AWS. So I'm trying to talk to all these customers, figure out what are the patterns we need to learn? What are the behaviors? What's the right way to set up a company to do this? And this is one reason I'm doing a talk a bit later on chaos engineering, because 
the chaos engineering is how you tell that you're doing a good job in this space, and it's why it's a hot topic now, right now, is because it's critical to doing this right and proving you're doing it right. So that's one book. Um, and I, you know, it's an interesting book to read, lots of good ideas in it. Here's another book. This is a book I've been talk, telling people to read for years. So if you've been to one of my talks in the last you know, five years or so, I've said, go read this book. But then I usually say, but don't read it if you're on an airplane. <laughs> because the examples in this book are people dying on planes and people dying in hospital. All right. It's a really, really deep book. And so, because I keep telling people not to read it, I assume that I, people like, have it on their to-read list and like, like, probably haven't read it. So how many people have actually read this book? Okay, like a handful of you. So I'm just going to go through chapter two, because I assume you haven't read it. Some of you may know what chapter two is here. It is the drift, and it explains, and it's the story of a plane crash. So again, not a happy ending. But I'm just going to walk you through something and you'll, and this is, this, this, uh, when I read this book, this was the piece of the book that stuck in my mind as an example of the kind of failure mode that we're trying to engineer around as we build really complex computer systems that are supposed to not go down and not fail. And then what happens is they, they, they work perfectly for a while, then they spontaneously do something really strange you've never seen before and, and crap out, and you go, how did that happen? Right. So, anyone know what this is? It's an airplane, right? But when, what kind of plane? <laughs> it's an Alaska plane. Okay, that was easy to figure out. Um, there's a whole series of these. It was originally the DC-9. It was designed in the early 1960s. And then a bit later, it became the MD-8. So Douglas built the DC-9. Then McDonnell bought Douglas, I guess. So it became McDonnell Douglas 80. And a bit later, eventually Boeing bought McDonnell Douglas, and it became effectively a Boeing 717. They still fly 717s. Um, most of the others are obsolete. And every generation, it got redesigned and made better and whatever. Um, and it was designed in 1962. Now, what kind of computers did they have in 1962 to design planes? There's a lot of slide rules, basically. You know, if you were designing parts on this, you over-engineered it, used slide rules. We were not doing, you know, complicated, you know, uh, computational fluid dynamics on, on Cray supercomputers or huge cloud arrays of cloud machines. We were like handcrafting these things. Right. Bits of these planes were designed then, and they've been carried forwards because they kind of seem to work. So we assume that they're just over-engineered, right? So I just talked about this. Chapter two is about a specific plane and a specific day. So January the first, two thousand, um, Alaska two six one. And it was flying from Mexico to Seattle. Right? So that's nice. That's once it's an easy flight. You're flying over airports everywhere as you go. That's pretty straightforward up the West Coast. And they got this little thing where the horizontal stabilizer appears to be jammed, right? Uh, what is the horizontal stabilizer? It's that bit. <laughs> right. And if you look at it carefully, you can see it kind of looks like it moves. The whole thing moves. Do you see that sort of shaded bit up there? Um, basically, as it's flying, the fuel load changes, the baggage load changes, it's trimming the whole plane. The whole stabilizer jacks up and down a little bit and adjusts slightly. So this isn't the, you know, the elevator going up and down. It's the entire stabilizer is used to trim the plane as the plane flies. And during the flight, it's supposed to adjust. So they took off, everyone, they're flying in, and they're, they're somewhere over San Diego, and the system says, I, I'm trying to make an adjustment, and it stopped adjusting. So they go, ah, oh, crap, what should we do? Well, they call traffic control and say, I think we should try and land in LA, but they're supposed to be going to, actually the plane is supposed to stop in San Francisco on its way to Seattle. So they say, well, maybe you should go to San Francisco. Now, I think we're going to LA. This plane is getting, a bit, this is a worrying problem, right? We're not sure how, how we can, if we can get the plane into the right trim. We're gonna dump, we're gonna fly around a bit and dump some fuel load, and then we're gonna come into LA, then we'll try and fix the plane. So there's a whole lot. If you go, there's a Wikipedia page on this story, but the whole chapter, chapter two goes through this in a lot of detail with like the back and forth from the pilots. The pilots have no idea. In fact, the pilots never knew what, what had gone wrong to, in this plane. So this problem had never happened before. Right. So we're going to LAX, okay. And they go, oh, well, let's, let, let's try and figure things out. It's still on autopilot, and the system, but the autopilot's struggling a bit. So they disengage the autopilot. 
Um, immediately, <laughs> the plane went started nose diving, <laughs> and they start pulling back, and they were putting over 100 pounds of pressure on the, on the steering column to keep the thing level. They were pulling 120 to 140 pounds combined pressure to just hold the nose up. So the you know, plane goes, Arr! and they level out and go, uh, that wasn't good. Um, so they're yanking the thing back, trying to hold it steady. They keep going there, right? So they go, okay, let's slow down. Let's see if we can get this thing into any shape to land and tread, because the plane, they have one of the major controls they have is, is set to a, the wrong position. So they reduce the, the speed and they're flying out up, up outside, you know, just in the, above the ocean, outside LAX, you know, sort of trying to figure it out. They come down a bit, they reduce speed, they got the flaps down. Um, and the thing's slowing down, and then th there's a few more thumps and bangs, then a really loud noise. And then the nose pitch is down. It does that. It does that. And then they tried to get it back upright. And then the engine stalled. So, hit the ocean, a bunch of people died. So what went wrong? Um, but here's the thing, 2,300 similar planes, 95 million night flight hours, this is a problem that would never happen before, right? So that's 95 million hours of non-events. That's the good side, right? This is an incredibly safe plane. We still fly these planes today, the same design, right? So, so what actually happened? And should you feel good or bad about this? So you should be thinking, what went right? To not have this problem from 1965 when the plane went into service to 2000 with these 95 million hours, right? So this is like you get confronted, like you've built this wonderful computer system and it's working fine and one day it just like dies. It's shocking, right? We built it to not do that. So, in a real environment, a dynamic, real-world stressed environment, how do you cause these non-events to happen? How do you make it so that the thing works all the time? And there's a few principles here. We have redundancy, right? More than one way to do something. One fails, I have another way. The system had a bunch of redundancy built into it. Um, safety margins, right? Think about, you know, I have enough capacity to take today's traffic and I have some extra capacity in case I suddenly get more work to do or uh, I have to fly a bit longer. Like they put a bit of extra fuel in the plane so that if they get delayed, they can hang around for a while without running out of fuel, right? So they don't put in exactly the amount of fuel so there's a safety margin to get there. There's inspections and maintenance. Then those are to make sure that everything's set up the way it should be and it's maintained and everything is right. So do you patch your servers? That's kind of inspections and maintenance, right? So all of these things have analogies back into our computer systems, except our computer systems don't run for 95 million hours before they have a failure, right? We're failing all the time. <laughs> so <laughs> there's definitely something to learn here for, as we're building critical systems. So here's, here's the back end of one of those planes. And that's that tail plane. You can kind of see the bit that moves here. And there's a jack screw at the front that cranks the thing up and down, which is a big thread. I think it's an inch and a half thick or a couple of inches thick screw thread with a huge nut on it. And, the th and a motor that twists this thread and it winds the nut up and down and that nut drives the entire thing, right? There's like about 5,000 pounds of, of thrust on this thing as it's operating. So it's taking like two or three tons of stress on this jack screw as, as the plane's operating. So it's a pretty heavily engineered thing. There's a backup motor for turning it. Um, in this case, both motors were just like their current was maxing out. They'd both jammed. The whole thing had jammed. So this is what it looks like. That's kind of the top of the fin. There's motors. Um, there's a thread, and this whole thing is cranking up and down on a, on a hinge, right? And there's only one thread, so there's a single, so we don't have redundancy on this system. We have redundancy on the motors, but not on this thread. Um, 
And the, basically what had happened was the, the screw stripped the thread. And that the, th you know, the thing is winding up and down. Eventually, after you, if you drive it enough times, it wears the thread out, and then the thread stripped. You've always seen like a nut stripped on a, on a screw if you over tighten something. So it was that. And then the thing is basically flapping around, and the stabilizer went to full up. So basically, the back of the plane now, you have something. The front of it was lifted up, and the plane just tries to nosedive. So that's, that's what crashed. The pilots had no idea this was happening. They didn't understand at any time um, what the actual failure mode was. They thought that one of, part of the elevator stabilizer had, had broken or something like that. They were just confused the whole time. So there's a screw with a thread and a nut in it. Um, so let's look at this. 1965, they said, you should lubricate this nut on this screw every 300 to 350 flight hours to make sure that it doesn't wear out. Okay, seems reasonable. Um, and then there was like committees and reports and analysis that, you know, it's probably a bit too often. We're gonna, it, it seems we'll be working safely. We've never had a failure. We're gonna push it a bit further. And this is the drift. This is, where the, this is the story of the drift that led to the failure. Um, so let's look at the lubrication interval. Yeah, about a, it turns out this is about every two weeks. So every couple of weeks, you have to stop the plane, park it in for maintenance, somebody has to go and lubricate this thing. All right, there's a bunch of other things that get maintained at that point. In 1985, there was a deregulation of the air industry. And the interesting thing is, air traffic was safer after deregulation than before. The number of fatalities and accidents and problems did not go up with deregulation. It continued to go down. It's been going down consistently. Air travel has been getting safer and safer and safer over the decades since the 50s or 60s when it started. So this, is not, this did not cause problems like across all deregulation, across all industries. However, um, the new rules, they let them do it every 700 flight hours. Right. That was the new standard. It seems like, yeah, this thing's a pretty reliable piece. As long as you grease it every 700, we're good, right? And then in 1987, there were some changes in the schedules for the way that they recommended things. This is all going through industry committees, and everyone, no, but everyone at every stage is being incredibly diligent about, is this a safe thing to do? So they pushed it to 1,000 hours. Um, 1988, there was kind of another change that re put it into a different interval, so it ended up every 1250. Um, in 1991, it was every 1,600 flight hours. And then by 1996, they switched it to another schedule and looked at it every eight months, uh, which is 2550 flight hours. So this is, that's a drift, right? So no one has ever seen a problem. They're all just fine. This is a heavily over-engineered part. Somebody with a slide rule kind of did it. They did not do a detailed thing. So, you know, that's kind of, you're just pushing the limit here. The economies of trying to run a low-cost airline are causing people to just get that little bit closer to the edge. So the actual parts they recovered off the plane pretty much showed that it probably hadn't been lubricated in 5,000 hours. They'd skipped their lubrication, or it hadn't been done right, and, and that was why it stripped. It was just running dry for a long time, and it stripped through, right? So what can you say there? That's a failure, but whose fault was it? Was it the a technician that didn't lubricate it the last time? Or was it that all those committees that led up to it? There's no one person at fault. This is like, if you do the blameless postmortem on this, like, like, the system making correct decisions at every stage caused the failure. Right? There was no point of failure. It's a systemic problem that, that ganged up on you. So we should have checked that, right? Well, there's a maintenance inspection check. And what happens in this check? They go and they open up this little hatch and they measure it to see how much wear there is. They measure the play in the thing. They, they basically load it up and sort of jiggle it around a bit and measure to see if it's got any wear in it. When they designed the plane, they said this part, yeah, you've got to oil it every now and again, grease it, but it should have 30,000 flight hours flight design life. So they, because it, will, it was going to long life, they, did, they didn't need to put much effort into making it easy to maintain or inspect. So there's a couple of little hatches to get into. Right. Um, after a few years of, of flying it, they said, actually, these things are wearing faster than we thought. We should inspect them every 3,600 hours. So they changed that. So that was, a, you know, 
useful experience. We go actually validate our theories. That's, this is good engineering practices. Um, then the average rate deregulation, the same deregulation, and they made it um, every 5,000 flight hours. This is because they were switched the schedule to 2,500 hours, and it was every other one of those. So that was kind of the, why that happened. Um, and then the inspection became every 26 months, and then that got stretched in another update to every 30 months, and um, 30 months is about 9550 flight hours. This is getting, getting a little bit up there. Um, and when you're inspecting it, you're looking for a tolerance. You're saying, how worn is it? And so you have a little machine for testing that. So let's look at that. Uh, the last time they inspected the plane, it was just at the limit. It was at the limit, and that was actually exactly at the limit. And they were going like, well, if it's exactly at the limit, should you change it or not? Um, you know, and the technician wanted to change it, uh, but they didn't have the spare part, and they just like got a couple, they just left it. And a couple of shifts later, um, somebody else tested it and managed to, and there's enough slop in the thing that they managed to get it to pass, and then the plane flew off. Right. So that was the guy that complained that it should have been changed. Eventually, there was a whole lawsuit around that because. He, he, did, he sort of whistle blew on it and got fired and then had a lawsuit and it was back and forth and eventually he, he, he won and Alaska got, got dinged pretty hard for, for having a culture of suppressing bad news. But you're trying to run a low cost airline, not go out of business. That your proximate problem is don't go out of business, right? That's the problem you're optimizing for every day. And this is a failure that's never happened in decades. So why am I optimizing for something that might happen when I've got a real problem that is happening, that I'm spending too long, and it's costing too much to maintain these things. So you can see how the economics drives our behavior here. So there's no maintenance action taken in 1997, the plane crashed three years later. This is a little quote of what it's like to do that particular maintenance. You're in the basket of a lift truck, lifted up by the tailplane, outside, in the rain, quite often at night, because that's when the plane's not flying, going through two access panels where you can just about get your hand in. <laughs> right. So, and, and then the tool you're using for it had been constructed by Alaska themselves, and it wasn't calibrated to the manufacturer spec. It was just a tool that tried to do the measurement um, roughly the same way that the original manufacturers asked them to. So you can see, okay, this is all the drift all building up, right? Um, so, what really happens for the other 95 million hours uh, these planes fly and all the other times we fly that cause there to be no fatalities in nine years of flying, right? It's a reporting and a learning culture. Humans report things. The airlines that report more are the airlines that have a better safety record. So this is about the culture of blame versus culture of reporting, learning, and judgment. So you're always trying to learn and you're always trying to study the things that didn't go wrong. Because humans are causing these non-events that keep things working safely. And you need to study the non-events because you can't study the events. They are infrequent outliers that don't happen often enough to get a sample, and every time they happen, they're different. So the only thing you can study is the daily making of a non-event. The every time a plane flies and doesn't crash or doesn't hurt somebody, you need to study those to understand how close did you get. This is, this is actually, I'm just going to tell, finish up with a few things which are really about you know, leading into the chaos engineering idea. Um, and my favorite little, little presentation, piece of my presentation here is, is this one. Like, we've all done fire drills, right? Usually when I get to this slide, a fire alarm goes off and we all have to file out. This has happened multiple times so far. I've done this, used this slide a few times. Pretty much everybody in the world that has ever worked in an office building understands what to do in a fire drill. In every elevator, in every country in the world, the elevator has a little sign saying, event of fire, do not use the elevator. Right? There's a universal building code. It's, it's amazing how everyone in the world has discovered that this is a, that this is a good practice to follow. And when the buildings do catch fire, people know what to do. They don't get, they don't get a stack of people waiting at the elevator. People go down the, you know, People may be a little bit panicked, but there is much better chance that people are going to get out alive. So the fact that we run fire drills, 
We have standard processes, and everyone knows those processes must have saved a lot of lives over the years. All right, so think about that, because when our IT systems blow up, who's running the fire drill? How do we know what to do? How do we know how to get on a call? How do we know how to run through the incident process? How do we know how to triage it and get it back up and running quickly um, and not have everything spiral out of control and get worse, right? So this is kind of my talk for, I'm on a bit later today, really what I'm talking about. But this is, this is where chaos engineering comes from. You can go read the book. Um, the author of the book, doing the, one of the authors is doing a talk at lunchtime. So this is, I'm not gonna go into this in more detail because that's what we're talking about later. But this is actually one of the definitions of safety coming from Todd Conklin's book on fatalities. Safety is a dynamic non-event. In a dynamic, complex system with things shooting at it all the time, if you are creating non-events, you are creating safety. And that is a very different way of thinking about it than just saying, I want nothing to go wrong. It's a dynamic system. You have to actively create safety by learning about how much margin you have in every direction. And so you need to instrument and study these non-events. And the, statistically, we aren't, ha we, don't, we aren't good at dealing with this because if you do any statistical modeling, one of the first things you do is discard the outliers because otherwise your model doesn't fit. And what you should really do is model, yeah, discard the outliers, and then flip it and discard everything that was fitted and just look at the outliers. Because the outliers are the things like, why did this outlier happen? Is that a near miss? Is it somebody about to die? Is there something gonna happen? Or is it just a measurement error or a glitch? And most people say, it's just a glitch. Okay, but if you understand what your glitches are, then you have some hope of finding the ones where the system is actually in a bad state. So you gotta be aware of these drifts, right? And understand them. And yeah, there will be economic pressure and there's always ways to optimize, but it's important that you understand how much margin you have left in your safety dimension for things that matter. And I got a few examples I'll talk about later, like forgetting to renew the domain name and whatever, but this could be you tomorrow, right? All kinds of bad things can happen. You have no idea. You know, hopefully we don't have people running out of the room because their pager just went off because their site went down. But that, you know, this is a fact of life. This is what we do. So that was what I had to say. Um, next up in here, we have the, the, the track where um, Russ Miles will be talking about chaos engineering, and I've got to talk on chaos architecture after him. Um, so that's, that's what I had to say. Hopefully you still feel good about flying home if you were fly, flew here. And uh, really you should be much more scared about driving to the airport, right? That, that get, get the, try to calibrate your sense of what is actually dangerous. And, and it's okay to take a window seat. Really, that is, that's not, not a really big problem. All right, so hopefully you're not too scared by that and uh, found that interesting. I'll take a few questions um, and then we can wrap up. Yeah, thanks. I was a little scared when you first told me you were gonna talk about plane crashes. <laughs> But that was, it was great. You made it super relevant, so I appreciate that. Just a reminder, uh, if you want to ask Adrian a question, he'll be around today too, but also just type your question in the conference app and we'll, we'll go through those. Sorry, I just wanted to refresh to make sure I got the latest ones. What are the regulations for inspections now or after accidents in general? I mean, the airline industry, what are the regulations? So, like the, I guess the responses. Right? The responses, there's the uh, is it NTSB, the National Transport Safety Board or something. So every report, I mean, you can go look up the details of Flight 261. Um, there's a, a very detailed report, they go figure it out and they go work through all of the things that can be learned from that. So this is one of the reasons the airline industry has such a good safety record. Every failure is very carefully inspected and they are trying to encourage um, this sort of open sharing of, of incidents and, you know, and they, go, they go back and they find that companies have got a bad culture and they find them and they you know, get them to fix their culture. Right? Um, they license the planes to fly, so the airlines to fly. So they have pretty reasonable amount of control over what happens. So generally the industry is, is, gets better each time. Um, 
Gametsa, the Southwest event. I didn't, you know, that's pretty new. They're still investigating it. It turns out that there was already a plan to in, investigate those engines, the, the engine that blew. Um, it was probably, if it, you know, it was, you know, you can say it was unlucky. If, if, it, if it had lasted a few more months, it probably would have been tested and taken out of service. Right? They were actually in the middle of looking at, for that problem. So, you know, there's, there's some luck in there. Um, but this is a series of things. Like, it's the, all the things build up, and eventually something tips you over. The last thing that tips you over and, and breaks the system is not the cause. It's this huge chain of events going back to the original design decision to sort of build a thing that, that had that failure mode in it, and then the compensating controls being eroded over time. So that's, that's the way to think about these things. Thanks. Uh, you're touching on this a little bit, but you said after failures, most companies' knee-jerk reactions actually make things worse. Could you talk a little bit about that and maybe yeah. also how we could be better about the knee-jerk reactions? Yeah. Um, this is kind of like that whistleblower syndrome. If you complain that something's unsafe and you, quite often you get fired for it or you, don't, or you get pushed out or whatever, people don't want to hear the bad news. So that's one problem. Um, there's multiple cases where, where that kind of thing has happened. In the aftermath of a, of a fatality at a company, um, you know, companies might just like fire everybody that was involved, right? Fire the manager because it's their fault. You've got to find somebody. There's like, you've got to find somebody to blame, and the company doesn't want to be responsible. They want to blame somebody. They want to blame another worker, or they want to blame a manager, or they want to blame something, or the person that invented the process, or the manufacturer of the thing that broke. Right? That's blaming the most proximate cause. And there is a really, like, almost a knee-jerk um, psychological need to find somebody to blame and to make it simple and clear and to say this was the fault. Whereas, in fact, we're talking about complex systems with a long chain. People don't want to hear the, you know, the 20-year history of, of the very minor good-natured good decisions that built up to cause this problem. Then there's nobody to blame. Uh, and there's no resolution, right? So that's the psychological problem. And Todd Conklin talks a lot about, about that in his book. So follow up, how do we break that kind of culture? I think, I mean, there's, you see think, people talking about blameless postmortems. Um, so, uh, um, John Osborne's talked a lot about this. There's, uh, there's a thing called the Stella Report. If you go Stella.report, uh, a lot of people from the safety industry took a look at software system safety and wrote up like that it's the intersection of the people that work in this space and the software side of it. So people are trying to come up with some better patterns here for what's the right thing to do. But it's, like I say, we've got you know, situations like recently one of the Tesla cars you know, hit a barrier and killed the occupant and you know, it, was it was under autopilot control at the time and the autopilot was trying to tell him you, sh you, sh you need to take control and he didn't and you know, so. You know, who's at blame there, right? Well, you could say, well, the software maybe should have been uh, more um, whatever, right? Should, should have tried to wake him up more. But, you know, there's a whole bunch of assumptions here about usability. Uh, there's another example, um, air, air fighters. I was listening to a podcast recently by one of Sam Charrington's uh, This Week in, uh, in Machine Learning, Twimmel Talk, it's called. And he had um, a, somebody who was a fighter pilot and she was uh, a fight pilot in the 90s, flying, I think, F-14s. And she said about what, every month, one of her other pilots died because of a terrible user interface on the plane. <laughs> right. That was the cause. That was, from her point of view, the fact that the planes were hard to understand and hard to control was killing people. This is, this is peacetime. This is not fighting, dying in battle. This is just people flying the planes around in practice sessions and crashing because the planes were incredibly hard to control and had a terrible user interface. So she ended up as a professor at university working on human factors and in robotic control systems as a sort of her reaction to doing that. She's one of the leading experts in this. Her name's Missy something, but I've forgotten the surname. So there's a lot of examples here where things we build, particularly when you get into safety critical systems, are. And we, yesterday we saw some pictures of some mining equipment, people operating stuff there. If that user interface was wrong or bad, that you could easily do something that would do something dangerous down the mine, right? And so how do you build systems that are, really take those things into account? It's important. Thank you. So we have time for one more question. And this one I think is at the core of your presentation. 
So is cloud infrastructure more or less complex than an airplane? Is what? Is cloud infrastructure more or less complex than an airplane? Um, is cloud infrastructure more or less complex? It's in many ways less complex because it's more manageable. If you look at a typical disaster recovery, like I like, like to ask people, if you've got a backup data center, they, yeah, we have a backup data center, and there's, how often do you fail over to it, and they start looking uncomfortable, and they say, well, okay, if you fail over apps one at a time, good. How often do you actually kill the entire data center and practice failing over, and they say, basically, never. I, I've run it under one, com one person has had the right answer, we do it every couple of weeks, but it's basically, vanishingly small number of people, maybe once a year after many months of practice, if you are regulated and are forced to do it, you will do that, right? So why is it difficult? Because data centers are artisanally constructed snowflakes. They are all different. They are very, very hard to get two data centers to be the same. And when you fail over something, it's landing in an environment where it's now yeah, sort of roughly the same, but you don't really know if it's going to work. And it's incredibly high failure rate in failover scenarios and disaster recovery scenarios. If you take clouds, we've standardized it. Like the API to this cloud region is the same as the API to this cloud region. This cloud formation template will run in both places, create your infrastructure. You can automate things, and it becomes um, commoditized, productizable, a, a, a relatively low-cost, reliable thing to do a disaster recovery failover in a cloud. So in some sense, the standardization of interfaces has caused a, a, a simplicity at that level. I mean, under the hood, there's more complexity, but the, the whole thing about simplicity is if you do it right, you have the right simple abstraction to some complex things underneath. I mean, an individual data center may be less complex than a cloud, but it's got more random variation in it, and the clouds uh, take that out by creating a much more standardized environment. So that, I think, is the interesting, that's the inflection point we're at, and that's part of what I'm interested in, is to build these uh, disaster recovery automation systems. And I, uh, going back to the Netflix example, when I was at Netflix four years ago, roughly once a quarter we ran a disaster scenario where we shut down a zone or a region to make sure the system worked. Over the last few years they've sped it up. It's now, they do about every two weeks, and it takes them six minutes to evacuate a region. They don't even file a, tell everybody they're doing it. They just, you know, at random points in the week, they will yank, yank the system, and everything is supposed to still work. Right, so that's kind of state of the art, and uh, people are looking at that. It's a difficult thing to get to, but I think that is, it's possible. You can't say it's impossible to do anymore. And it's always good to have somebody out there doing the impossible things and proving that you, they can be done. So we will talk more about that in, uh, in my talk at 11.15. Great, yeah, well, and if you're you. interested in learning more, I'd stick in this room, because the track is all about this kind of topic. Can we do one more round of applause for Adrian? Thank you.